Well, praise God, everybody. Great to be with you today. Amen. Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. I hope that you are a worshiper every day. Hope that every day you engage, invest, you are covered by the umbrella of God's grace. We are in this series called Pre-Decide. We want to make decisions ahead of time instead of the heat of the moment. Whether it's temptation, whether it's being generous, whatever it may be. I love Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8 where Daniel purposed in his heart not to eat of the king's delicacies. David purposed in his heart that he was going to serve God. Did he mess up? Constantly. But we can identify with David because in the heat of the moment, he made decisions and he had uh, consequences for that. But if you were to select one word that would identify who you are, what you wanted to be, your character, uh, your life, what you stand for, what would that one word be? Would it be successful? Would it be happy? Would it be blessed? Would it be influential? Because those are some terms that uh, consecutively arise when people are asked, what one term or one word would you like to describe your life. But I believe in the eyes of God, he might have something different if we were to examine that. Because when we get to heaven, I do not believe that God will say, well done, you successful person. Well done, you happy person. Well done, you blessed person. Well done, you influential person. But the one word that can absolutely change your life will be what he declares when he says, well done, thou good and faithful person. And so we want to examine that for a moment. Is it possible that we can pre-decide that we're going to be faithful day by day, hour by hour, week by week, every year? It's one thing to come to an altar and have an experience with God that affects your emotions because we are emotional creatures and we are affected by what we see, what we hear, what happens to us. God made us that way. In fact, he takes our tears and some he puts in a bottle and some he writes in a book. He is moved with compassion at our infirmities, our weaknesses, the challenges in our life. But we must go beyond, I think, just desiring to be happy, blessed, successful, and influential because I know people that are those things and God is not a consideration in their life. But being faithful to God touches every avenue of our life at every level and every dimension. And so we understand in this series that the quality of our life is determined by the quality of our decisions. The decisions that we make impacts our life. In fact, we are impacted by the decisions we make. We are who we are because of the decisions that we make. The three Hebrew children made a decision that they were not going to bow when the music began as those that were in the valley because of the statue that the king had erected. And the king loved these three young men, and when he saw that they did not bow, he stopped the orchestration of the musical melodies and said, maybe you didn't hear. And they said, oh, king, we are not careful about responding to you. In other words, we've thought about this. We have pre-decided whether we live, whether we die, whether we go through the furnace, whether we don't, we will not bow to an image that you have created. And in that moment, they had already pre-decided. It doesn't matter what you do. doesn't matter how you set up some kind of system. And systems are being set up in this nation that you're not even aware about. Trying to manipulate trying to control, trying to monitor. I believe it is sad when you have monetary leaders of this nation talking about population control yeah. and a variety of things. 
Are we going to pre-decide? For years I sat in church and I was told, we'll be out of here before any trouble happens. I've been in a lot of trouble since then. I've had a lot of trouble come my way since then. Trouble is a part of life. Trouble is going to come against you. Opposition, challenges, because you take a stand and you're going to live for Jesus Christ. I'm wondering if we could pre-decide, no matter what happens, whether I'm in a valley or a mountaintop, whether I'm in a storm or in the refuge of his hand, I'm going to be faithful. Whether I walk in abundance or lack, I'm going to be faithful. Whether I'm going through a trial, I'm going to worship him no matter what. In everything, give thanks, for this is the perfect will of God concerning Christ Jesus for you. And so when we're faced with temptations, we've shared some of these things. What do I do when fear tries to latch onto my life and anxiety and apprehension? I'm going to pre-decide that God has not given me a spirit of fear but of love, power, and a sound mind. A sound mind is a mind without variance a mind without darkness, a mind that is not contaminated. That only happens as we devour the Word of God. What do I do when all of a sudden the doctor gives me a diagnosis or I have symptoms in my body that I'm concerned about? How many of you have ever had symptoms and you refuse to go to the doctor? How many of you are Google doctors today? God bless you. Welcome. Because if something goes on in my life, I Google it. And then I have to be prepared for what I read. Come on, somebody. If you're going to Google your symptoms, then be prepared for the Word of God to be the antidote. No matter what I read, it gives me the opportunity to take authority over a spirit of infirmity that is manifesting itself. And I declare he was wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him, and by his stripes I am healed. And you may have to confess that often because if you're going to be your own doctor, you better know what the doctor Jesus has to say about your condition. What do I do when those things happen? There are other scriptures, Psalms 103 and verse 3. He forgives all my iniquities. He heals all of my diseases. He redeems my life from destruction. Come on, he anoints my head with oil. He leads me beside still waters in Psalms 23. The Lord, the self-existent God who reveals himself to man is my shepherd, the one that goes before me. I shall not lack, be deficient, or want in any area of my life. What do I do when temptation tries to overwhelm me? Because There is a prophecy about Judah in the Old Testament, and it said sin crouches at the door. Sin lurks. The enemy watches for areas of vulnerability in your life, and when you are at your most vulnerable, that's when he makes a decision to strike at you. We have to pre-decide that in 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter wrote and said, your adversary, the devil, it's your adversary. It's not just mine, it's your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But the next verse says, but resist steadfast in the faith. Determine in your heart that you're going to resist. What if I fall prey to that? What will it cost me? What will it do to my life? How How will I deal with an emotional trauma if I engage in this? And then later I find forgiveness because Jesus will forgive anything. But then we have to deal with the regret. Why did I do that? Why do I continue to do that? Wouldn't it be better to pre-decide that I'm going to be faithful? And you're not going to be accidentally faithful faithful. Faithfulness is not something that just drops out of the cloud because of a great service. Whether you worship today or whether you didn't, he's faithful. Whether you're going through a bad day or a good day, he's faithful. Whether you're having a spasm emotionally or not, he's faithful. No matter what you're facing, he's faithful. No matter what you've been through, he's faithful. And he deserves our faithfulness. He deserves our trust. He is worthy of those things. 
the trajectory in our life has a tendency to lean towards that which is easy and convenient. I never cease to be amazed. I'm normally up early. McDonald's and Hardee's open at 5 o'clock. And there's normally a line all the way around. Now, if you see my car there, I want you to know, this is my disclaimer, I'm getting oatmeal. If you see me there and think, he's a hypocrite. No, I'm getting my oatmeal. All right? I've had enough struggles and challenges with clogged arteries. Why is it when sickness comes, we run to Jesus quickly? Wouldn't it be better to pre-decide to take care of this body, which is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and maybe eat some things that are good for you? Could I just throw this out for all of you that are having cholesterol problems? Avocados will lower your cholesterol immediately. But I hate it. I didn't say you'd like it. Put some salt on it, some peanut butter. Pour some Kool-Aid on it. Put it in your special K. Do something. But there are things out there that will help you. But we have a tendency to take the easy, convenient way. When I was in college, I was not a chef at all. I would boil water. So in those days, you could buy a beef pot pie for 13 cents. Yes, I am that old. And so that's what I did. Was it the best for me? No, it has enormous amounts of salt. I better get off this because I'm I'm just watching countenances change very rapidly. So if we would would bring ourselves to the place where we'll be faithful and do what's right, it's rarely easy, sometimes it's hard, and most times it will cost you something. But in the scripture today, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, a minor prophet that was prophesying during the time of Jeremiah in a, a moment where Israel was in a place of captivity, he reveals much about himself but he talks about vision and writing it and making it plain and going to the watchtower of prayer to see what the Lord might say. But then he looks and he declares this in verse four. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves. We are in a culture today where we have an enormous amount of ingenuity, an enormous amount of knowledge. We're able to create a spacecraft that can fly into orbit and come in entry back into the atmosphere and resist 6,400 degrees worth of heat. But there's still not enough ingenuity in man to prevent death or its rewards or judgments. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Come on, somebody. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. The King James says, the just shall live by faith. What does it mean to be faithful? How do we live that out every day of our life? What does it look like that will set us apart and cause uh, us to be the pipeline for the goodness of God? Well, there are three areas that I believe Jesus addressed when his ministry in three and a half years. And number one, how do we treat people? Because every interaction is an opportunity to add value. When you walk into a room, you either add value or you suck the life out of it. I was in a group the other day. I walked in the room and I looked at this person and it's just like the life is descending. There's no atmosphere of peace, joy, anything. Have you ever walked into those rooms? I don't want to be the person that walks in a room and sucks the life out of everybody because I can only handle that so long. You ever been around people that just drain you and they have the answers but, and it's an open book test but they refuse to open the book? They know what to do but they don't do it. We're waiting for somebody to come along and lay hands on us and prophesy over us and tell us what the problem is because it makes us feel good, makes us feel like God's gonna do it and yet we have the responsibility to be faithful. Hallelujah. So every interaction that we have is an opportunity. And so Jesus teaches us how to deal with other people. He taught us in the Gospels that they will know you are my disciples by your love. Love has the ability to transform a room. Has the ability 
to transform and impact lives that are around you. You say, but I don't feel like loving them. Well, God loves you all the time. And you have been the recipient of his love. Even when you had an attitude and said some things to him about, God, you don't even care about me. doesn't look like you're even for me. I don't think I'll go to church today. If I do, I'm going to sit there and suck the life out of everybody else. God's still up there going, I love you no matter what. Now, I can't wrap my head around that because I have a problem with some people. (laughs) You just need to pray for me because I need some help. Some people make it a real challenge to invest in them. Do you remember the parable when Jesus taught in Luke chapter 13 and the householder came and he had planted a tree and it had been three years and it had no fruit. He came and he said, cut it down. And the man that took care of the vineyard said, give it one more year. Give it one more year. Let me dig around it. Let me fertilize it. Sometimes God fertilizes us through means and avenues that are not always pleasant. Some of you have heard this story, but some of you look like you desperately need to hear it again. There was a, there was a little bird that was living in uh, Georgia, in Atlanta, outside of Atlanta. He had relatives in Chicago, and in December, he decided to make the flight back. So he got to Southern Illinois and it wasn't too bad and he gets over Moultrie County around uh, Christmas and it's just frigid and the more he flies, the more he recognizes that his wings are being weighted down by ice. All of a sudden he finds himself descending rapidly and he finds himself in a barnyard. In the midst of that moment, a cow comes over and plops. Do you know what plop means? He didn't sit on him, plopped on him. And the bird thought, this is so, this is just, this is horrible. Just trying to go visit my relative in Chicago, and now I'm in Moultrie County, the smallest county in the state of Illinois. And I'm in a barnyard with all over me. But then he recognized he was starting to warm up. And as he began to get warm, a cat came and pulled the plop off of him. And the moral of the story is this. Everybody who plops on you is not your enemy. And everybody that removes it is not your friend. And we don't like those situations in life where we feel like we have the aroma and the smell of degradation and things have happened. But are we willing to be faithful to the one who was faithful to us first? Faithful is he who calleth you who also will do it. God is faithful. And so we have opportunities to invest in people's lives. And we're never going to consistently add value to someone if the focus is on us. Have you ever been in a group picture? Who's the first person you look at? This is uh, part of the remains of the class of 1970. Some are unrecognizable. And uh, when I got the picture in the mail, do you know who I first looked to? Because if my picture's okay, the whole picture's okay. (laughs) If my picture's not good, we're getting rid of it. I wasted 30 bucks. Now, you may or may not recognize them. I had a hard time recognizing some of them. But I just want to ask you a question. Uh, have, have, can you find a person in that picture who looks disgruntled, sad, unhappy? Just, I'll give you a moment. Have you found him yet? It's a male with a blue shirt. What happened? On the way to this, re- what happened? Did your ex-girlfriend not show up? Was the food bad? Did you get a cockroach in your coffee? Because most people there are fairly happy. But there's one that really stands out. And he's just not happy. And that can take your attention also. 
But if we're going to invest and we're going to make a difference in people's lives and every opportunity, every situation is an opportunity to invest and interact with somebody and add value to their life, then we cannot just be focused on us. That's the challenge we face in our world today. Things are about us. And the more we begin to invest in things that are for us, the more promoters begin to advertise things that are about us. Okay? Can I just give you an example? They've got all kinds of weight loss programs out there. Now they've got gummy bears for heart disease, gummy bears for diabetes, gummy bears for no hair, gummy bears for too much hair, CBD oil, for whatever your problem is. Most of those things don't work. Take this vitamin because 52 people have testified to incredible results, but they also eat right. They also work out three times a week. Help me, someone. And we are gullible and vulnerable, and we spend our money on things trying to improve ourselves instead of recognizing we have value and we're here to invest and make a difference in somebody else's life. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, Paul writes this, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. That's enough to say amen, go home. That's a standard right there in a watermark. If you can do that this week, we're doing well. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for what? Building others up according to their needs that it may be beneficial to those who listen. That's helpful for what? Building others up for their needs. Building others up for their needs. So we're here to invest and interact and try to make a difference in other people's lives. And Jesus, he taught the disciples because in Matthew chapter 6, the disciples were uh, concerned about life, concerned about the needs in their life. They were concerned about everything that was happening in their life. And Jesus taught them in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. If it's not there, I will find it quickly. It's a part of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus declares to them in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, down through verse 28, agree with thine adversary quickly while he is in the way with, with you, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge. The adversary there is not the devil. Sometimes the adversary is the Holy Spirit that brings conviction in our life to see whether or not we will yield and surrender to the reality of what we're called to do because every interaction is an opportunity to add value. And then later on, down in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, he tells them, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these other things shall be added. He said, the lilies of the field, they neither spin nor churn, but they have more glory than Solomon. A sparrow lights from one branch to another. And God takes note of that because the disciples were overwhelmed about how are we going to make it. I've learned this. If you're faithful to Jesus in those interactions, he will take care of you. He'll take care of all things. In John chapter 8, there was a woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. All of the focus was upon her. The religious people were there ready to stone her because she had violated the law, and the law said that she should be stoned, she should be killed. Jesus stoops down, he writes in the ground. I don't have the time to uh, exasperate that whole passage, but then he looks up and he says, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. When we begin to walk into a group and a setting and we find that we want to have the focus upon us. We need to remember there are people that are around us that are hurting. Maybe we find ourselves being in judgment of other people and what they're doing, but let's never forget that we were once in sin and in a pit, and Jesus delivered us, and we made the choice and the decision, and he pulled us out. And so they dropped their stones one by one. She's feeling condemnation. She's feeling shame, and the words of Jesus 
Jesus could have said many things in that moment. He could have said, do you not know who I am? But the focus was not on him. He was the pipeline through which mercy would flow from the throne of God. And she looked up and he said, where are thine accusers? And they had walked away. He said, neither do I accuse you, go and sin no more. So wherever Jesus went, it wasn't about him. It was about what impact he could have for those that were around him. Peter denied Jesus three times. Can you imagine? Peter is always the one that is more vocal than everyone else. He's the first one to the chalkboard. He doesn't always have the right answer. He denies Jesus three times. The conviction strikes him. He goes to his house, and the Bible says he weeps bitterly. But in John chapter 21, here's what Peter did. Peter said, I'm going fishing. He had heard about the resurrection of Jesus. Mary and Martha had come back and said he's alive, but he could not embrace that. So Peter is fishing. Jesus comes along. He's on the beach. He said, children, have you caught anything? Now, I don't know where Jesus got the fish. I don't know if he walked out on the water or if he just spoke it and created it because he's a God of miracles. Peter recognizes who it is. He runs to the shore, and the dialogue between Jesus and Peter is very critical. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, you know I love you. Those words are different than feed my sheep. The first word means, yeah, I'm fond of you. Are you just fond of Jesus? Because if you're only fond of Jesus, you won't be faithful. And Jesus reaches to the core of his being the third time and says, Peter, do you love me? Peter's getting exasperated because his life really hasn't been transformed and some of the old Peter's rising up. Lord, you know he's ready to just go toe to toe. Lord, you know, he's sitting with the resurrected Christ, mind you. You know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. And when, when Jesus tells Peter to feed my sheep, the first one is spoon feed them. The second one is I want you to tend to them and supervise them. But the third time when Peter's response is you know I love you, it is I want you to pasture them and graze them and lead them to something that is powerful. Even in that moment, Jesus didn't say, when I needed you the most, where were you? He was still in that mode of operation where Jesus was faithful to his call and every, every interaction was an opportunity for him to add value, love, and build him up. And I'm not declaring that that's easy because it's challenging. Number two, Every resource is an opportunity to multiply. There's an old song that goes, little is much when he's in it, when God is in it. Little is much. You may not feel like you have a lot of talent. You may not feel like you have a lot of gifting. But don't find yourself in the position of the individual in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21. His master replied, this is the man that had uh, five talents, and that man took a risk and he multiplied those talents and came back with five more. One man had two talents. He came back with two more. The one man who had one talent hid it in the ground. Is it possible you don't see your life as having value? Is it possible that you don't see your life as having intrinsic gifting and the ability to impact others? And when you don't see that you have value, you will take a seat of pride and judgment and you will step back and judge what you don't like about what everybody else is doing. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over what? A few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, I don't mean to just rock your world today, but... It's very clear in Scripture, the man with one talent. Do you know what Jesus said to do with him? Take him and cast him into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you knew I was a hard taskmaster, then why didn't you take your talent and at least put it in the bank? Jesus taught more about money than he did 
hell. And what he's talking about in these talents is not only the ability and the gifting that you have, but how do you use your resources to make a difference? The man had that one talent, he didn't do anything with it. Whenever the Bible talks about outer darkness, it simply talks about away from the light. But when he adds weeping and gnashing of teeth, my friend, that's hell. Is it possible? This is why I am so urgently moved and concerned about what I see in the church because we want to be happy, successful, influential, and blessed. What about faithful in every arena of our life? Is it possible that we could have an experience with God and somewhere along the way lose that relationship to a degree where we just hang on to everything that we are? I'm not making a judgment today, I'm just saying there's scriptural basis for that. So the opportunity that we have, especially in the culture that we live in, is to do everything within our power, not to heap up riches for ourselves and not change anything about our life, but to engage with our culture because I watch certain debates on Facebook, it pops up, and I am amazed at the lack of CS, common sense. Let's not talk about biblical understanding, let's talk about common sense. Let's talk about second graders and first graders being taught to discover whether or not they're a male or a female. Can I just tell you something? We raised seven kids. I have no problem discerning which one is a girl and which one is a boy. We are in a culture that is self-absorbed, that does not want to listen to reasoning, but no one can resist the love of God the power of God, and investment in their life when they don't feel like they deserve it. And if we can begin to see people as one of God's creation, the word faithful, when Jesus told that man, well done, thou good and faithful servant, is from a word, paisos. It means a person who shows themselves faithful in the transaction of business, the execution of commands, or the discharge of of official duties. The man with five talents took a risk, my friend. Today, if your yard is ugly, in about 45 days, you have an opportunity to fix that. If you're saying, I drive a clunker, then let it be a clean clunker. Let it be an immaculate clunker. Wire that muffler up with bailing wire if you have to. Don't be like one person I saw on television, they bought a new house, and to celebrate, they went out and bought a new car. What are y'all thinking about? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Be careful what you're putting in it. Don't put things in it that later you complain about and go, there, there was an individual, I'd watch them eat, and they would eat and eat, then they'd sit and go, I'm just stuffed. I don't feel good. I ate too much. You want to pray for me? I guess, but I don't know how that's going to work. I don't know if the Spirit of God's going to come on you and you're going to empty your colon. I don't know. Why don't you measure your intake? Because that could change the outcome. So Jesus is very clear when he talks to the people that he gave the talents to in Matthew chapter 25, and he says to them in verse 25, to the man with the one talent, I was afraid. I wonder if we're afraid that we're not good enough, we don't know enough. Does our talent and gifting really count? Does my $2 to missions really count? Am I really making a difference? Whatever you do, Ecclesiastes says, do it with all your might, whatever your hand finds to do. And number three, Jesus dealt with the fact that every prompting is an opportunity to obey God. If you study the, the travelings of Jesus, you will see he was prompted to go to certain communities. He was prompted to go to Jericho. Those promptings, we need to pay attention to. 
Have you ever felt a prompting to give somebody a call, send them a text, drop them a note, write them a letter, pray for them? That's the Holy Spirit trying to get you into a position where you're adding value, where you're making a difference. You say, I wish God would speak to me. He probably has. You might not have recognized it. Because it can be as simple as a thought. It can be as simple as just saying something to some mom. How many of you have seen moms? I've seen them in Walmart with kids on the floor throwing a fit. I saw a little clip where this mother's child was throwing a fit, so she got on the floor and threw a fit too. It so startled the child that he got up and behaved. It did attract some attention. Are we investing in our life? Are we pre-deciding that we're going to be faithful? Whatever we do, when you are faithfully and fully pursuing Jesus, the Holy Spirit will prompt you to call, to pray, to do something, whatever it might be. Will you respond to that? Because our responsibility is to obey that prompting. It's God's responsibility to bring the fruitfulness. I called somebody the other day. I just, there are moments that it just, I'm driving somewhere, you need to call somebody. Come to find out they were dealing with uh, influenza, A, B, C, D, whatever it is, swine flu, three, four, 21. And I said, man, you called at the right time. Thanks. There's, there's other times that I've felt like I need to text this person. And they were on their way to some kind of a treatment. Don't don't eliminate the possibility of God using you. The only reason that God would not use us is if we've ignored him before. Right. Say, God, help me. Forgive me for not paying attention to those promptings. Let me be aware of the people I'm around. Let me be aware. It's not just a haphazard thought. It's not just a moment where I had too much pizza last night. It's in the middle of the day. I've already had my quart of coffee. I'm good. Let me respond to those things. Maybe you're not in a position where you can call or, or do something at that moment. Write yourself a note because God places someone on your heart. It could be a critical moment in their life and you can make a difference. And when that begins to happen to you, you change your life because all of a sudden you go, I, I really have some value. This is not about the person that stands in this pulpit. This is about you and I taking advantage of the opportunities that we have. There's too much leftover Catholicism in the Pentecostal church. We feel like only certain people have the ability. But we have weaknesses and flaws just like you. There's some days that, that we're spiritually schizophrenic disconnected, upside down. God, can you even use us? I'm struggling with this. So pre-decide, God, I'm going to be faithful no matter what it is. I want to add value. Every opportunity is an opportunity to interact with somebody and add value to them. My resources are an opportunity to be faithful to you and to your kingdom. And every prompting, if I respond to that in faithfulness, can potentially change somebody's life. What did we read? The righteous shall live by his faithfulness because you can sow enough seed constantly that it will continue to come back. Listen to me very carefully. I do not want to stand before Jesus Christ and have him evaluate my life and put on the screen all the opportunities that I missed and could have made a difference. Because in the final analysis, all of us are going to give an account for what we've done. Hello? You're real quiet right now. I still have five minutes. The bottom line is I'm going to be accountable for what I did every day. That's why there is an urgency in my life. Somebody made a statement to me yesterday and it's rocked my world for 24 hours, and I'm broken about it. And they're not hurting me, but their life is gonna come pulling apart at the seams if something doesn't change. And me trying to have a conversation to persuade them will not be enough. It's gonna take Holy Ghost conviction. 
It's going to take the power of the Spirit of God speaking to them. But I cannot afford to pull away, and I cannot afford not to pray, and I can't afford not to text and invest in that individual's life because life is not about me. Life is about you and I making a difference in someone else and propagating the power of the kingdom and being a light unto the world. Jesus said, you are a light that's set on a hill and you don't cover it with a bushel basket. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God. The just shall live by his faithfulness. Faithfulness. When I think about the faithfulness of God and the faithfulness of men and women to bring this house to where we are today. We started in May the 9th, May the 10th, 1979 in a Bible study. Six or eight people were there. Three of them wanted to be baptized immediately. We drove one hour, one way. Because I called a local pastor in town. I said, could we use your baptistry? He said, well, it's broken. And in my mind, it thought, this is what I thought. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. You're not prepared. You're not prepared. I wonder if we're praying prayers for fruitfulness that if God would bring 50 new people next Sunday, could we manage that? Would we interact with them? Be careful before you say yes. Because if you're the first one to get to the driveway and spin out on the asphalt, I would say you're not ready. Well, I don't like people. Then you're not ready. But you want Jesus to like you and you want other people to like you. But you don't want to interact with anybody else. And God's waiting to pour out his spirit and affect people's lives and going, where can I place them? Because we've prayed a prayer for God to bring increase doesn't mean that God's going to bring it if we're not in a position to minister to them, to invest in them, to help them, to interact with them, to be a blessing to them, to give them a word, to send them a card. And down through the years, we had prayer meeting on Monday night. We had Tuesday morning women's Bible study. Had a lady baptized in the Holy Spirit in that Bible study. Had Thursday night Bible study. This was while I was working 70 hours a week. I was much younger. And I watched God cause things to grow through the faithfulness of his people. My dad bought this property three and a half acres on September the 1st. We had a wedding the second Saturday of December. The brick for the baptistry had just been laid and the photographer got on top of it. So I'm doing vows and I'm seeing pictures behind me and I'm saying, God, don't let that thing collapse. It'd be a horrible thing for the photographer to fall in the baptistry today. <laughs> little by little, if you've been in our Discover New Life class, you can see how God brought opportunities to invest, to grow, to expand, to make a difference. If it hadn't been for faithful people, some of them are already gone on to meet with Jesus. You may never meet them, but they invested their life. They invested their resources. Thank God for godly businesses in this house that walk in integrity, that look for opportunities to make a difference, and they walk in their business with integrity to do the right thing. And I watch as you invested in this house on every two by six in this building and every two by four and every two by eight, somebody's name is written there. Names that we prayed over in that baptistry and that other baptistry. You may not be here by accident. It could be divine appointment. And if that's the case, then you're the branch and he's the vine. Let's be the branch. Let's invest. Let's be faithful because I promise you, When we stand before Jesus and he looks at you and you've been in his presence five seconds, everything you've ever had to walk through will dissipate. All the struggles, all the problems, all the pain, all the distress, all the betrayal, all the rejection, everything that's happened will dissipate in that moment. You will be captured by the love of God. You will be captured by the love of a Savior who stretched out his arms on Calvary's cross and loved you unconditionally and loved you in spite of what sometimes we are I promise you, it will be worth it all. Everything you've ever had to walk through will be worth everything. What kind of statement can be made when the Savior of the world, who paid a price for us that we did not owe, 
and we owed a price that we could not pay, looks you in the eyes and says, well done, good and faithful servant. I know you walk through horrible things. I know you walk through sickness and disease. I know things happen in your life that you questioned me about and did not understand. And in that moment, it won't matter. In that moment, all of the little idiosyncrasies and the people that agitate us that are thorn bushes in our life, it won't matter. It won't matter. How can I not be faithful to a God that loved us so much that for three and a half years he taught us how to walk, how to love, how to worship, how to pray, how to invest, how to be fruitful? Took death by the throat and said, you have no more authority over my children. Told the devil to his face, greater is he that's in them than he that's in the world. Put his plans before men and told hell, there's nothing you can do to stop them. Because on this rock, on this revelation, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You can't stop them. You can't impede them. They're faithful to me. They love me. They're embracing me. They know my power. They know my love. They know my faithfulness. And they are an army that's moving across the face of the globe. There is nothing you can do to hinder, restrict the power of God that is within them. And I'm going to do my best through preachers and evangelists and pastors and and prophets and apostles to engage them and help them to understand that in the midst of their struggle, they have value. In the midst of their sickness, I'm a healer. In the midst of their depression, I'm their joy. In the midst of trauma, I will bring triumph. In the midst of everything they're going through, I want to ignite a fire in them and I'm gonna release the power of my spirit on the day of Pentecost to cause them to rise up and move with the power of God and not be in intimidated by the world, the culture, or religion, because I have a church that will be faithful to me and will impact lives around me, and they will help people that are lost and tossed and turning and churning on the seas of demonic torment. I will cause them to be able to invest in men and women, and they'll be drawn to the church and drawn to others, and they'll invest their lives in serving in a life group, and the church will continue to move. It's not thwarted. It's not stopped. It's not ceasing. Do you know what the greatest religion on the face of the planet is the number one religion that is growing the fastest? Still Christianity. Everybody else's leader is dead and in the grave. God, I'm going to be faithful. Some days it's a challenge, but I'm going to be faithful. You don't always see the immediate rewards. Many times, we overestimate what may happen in the short run. And we underestimate what God can do through a life of a person that walks faithfully. Now, I need to correct a remark that I made about three weeks ago because somebody challenged me on it. And I take that challenge. I made the remark that I never thought about divorce or having an affair because of the child support. I hope you know that was a ha moment. This girl is awesome. If it hadn't been by divine connection with her, I don't know where I would be today. She's seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And she's still there. Gave birth to seven children. One child would make me run to Africa. One child would be, I'm done. You stay away from me. Don't you dare hold my hand. There was a basketball player at Greenville College that was a friend of mine. I found out he asked her out. I was not happy in the locker room. He was about six inches taller than me, and I'm 6'2". 
So what are you thinking about? <laughs> Leave her alone. I'm still working on this situation. I'm going to ask her to marry me. Has she said yes? No, but you leave her alone. I just want you to know that it was not because of child support. We made a decision that we were going to be faithful in sickness and in health. Our vows did say to love, honor, and obey, but we don't talk about that much. She's the love of my life. Does she aggravate me in three seconds? But there is an atmosphere in this world that tries to get us to be self-absorbed and we forget about the consecration we made to one another or to God to those people that you're sitting with. If you're in need, man, let me pray for you. Let me do my best to help you because we serve a great God. We serve an awesome God. I just pray that the Holy Spirit will brand on the altar of your heart. Be faithful to him. Faithful is he that calleth you and who also will do it. And in Revelations, we see a group of people that are faithful, called, chosen, and faithful. He's calling today. If you don't know him, if you're not consecrated and sold out to him, he's calling today. You say, how do I position myself to be chosen? By answering the call. John 15 says, I chose you, you didn't choose me. I've selected you, I've appointed you, I've ordained you, I've anointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That's why every day I begin to sing this. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Yes, he is. Hallelujah. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. He's the name above all names. He is worthy of our praise and my heart will sing how great is our God. I'll tell him now. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Father, I pray today for every individual in this place, those that are watching online. God, the investment that you have made in our life is overwhelming. It just makes everything in life come into perspective. And yet, Lord, we try to embrace the love and the faithfulness that you have shown to us. What can I do? The psalmist said, what can I render unto the Lord for his faithfulness to me and his benefits? God, we yield everything that we are. Lord, help us in every interaction to invest in people's lives and make a difference. Help us to take our resources and God, watch you multiply them as we're faithful. Lord, every prompting of your Holy Spirit, help us to listen. Help us to have a hearing ear that, God, we can impact somebody's life. Lord, we thank you today 
And in this moment, we pray this prayer with someone somewhere that's watching or within the sound of my voice that has not totally surrendered or consecrated or committed themselves to you. Church, pray it with me right now. Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I need your help. I have a sin problem. And you nailed my sin to the cross and showed me love. And you've been faithful. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life. Help me. Fill me with your spirit. Walk with me every day. I will be faithful to follow you with all my heart. In Jesus' name, if you prayed that today, let us know. We want to rejoice with you. But the greatest thing that could be said about you throughout eternity is that you were faithful. You were faithful. And if you're faithful, you'll be successful. If you're faithful, you'll be influential. If you're faithful, you'll experience the blessings of God. Amen. Amen. We call you blessed today.